Hey class, Eddie Knighton here with my module 2 initial reflection on race and ethnicity. Um, instead of approaching it from a white apologetics perspective where I just say the things that most white liberals say, I went into it with the mind frame of actually trying to uh, develop some growth. And I'm approaching this from three standouts from a piece called The Real Problem with Indian Mascots, one of the best things I've read so far in this course, uh, Waking Up White and Andrea Smith's Three Pillars of White Supremacy that's in her Rethinking Women of Color Organizing piece. Uh, the Real Problem with Indian Mascots stood out to me because my whole life, I haven't really thought much about the Indians. Even when I was a history major, I would skip chapters in books pertaining to Indians. Um, I never really knew why. I just told myself that it's just it's just really, really sad and unjust, and I just put my efforts elsewhere. But this piece with conjunctions of other pieces really, I think, explained and opened me up to why this is. Uh, Smith wrote that African Americans have been traditionally valued for their labor. Hence, it is in the interest of the dominant society to have as many people marked black as possible. By contrast, Indians have been valued for their land base they occupy, so it is in the interest of the dominant society to have a, a, as few people as possible marked Indian. Therefore, we've made Indians invisible in order to take their land and out of colonial necessity to avoid the guilt. If we haven't made them invisible, we've made them myths, mythology, to neutralize that oppression and that or genocide. The title references mascots. You know, she says Washington Redskins, but I can think of others, the Braves, the Cleveland Indians, the Kansas City Chiefs, and many commercial and businesses who use characters of Indians as mascots. You know, she names Applebee's. And um, I think that she would argue that this is part of a uh, disconscious racism, that at best we're just turning them into cartoon characters, and at worst um, we're, we're, we're making them invisible, we're eliminating them. And if there's no one there to discriminate against, then then we've done no injustice. Um, she talks about if we were to have sports teams called the New York N-Words or the Jersey Jigaboos or something like that, people would be all up in arms. But since, you know, these are Indian names and Indians are all but invisible in our society, then even most Indians would say, what's the big deal and controversy about these sports names? Uh, the negative effects of invisibility, of course, is the marginalization of Native Americans as a, as a uh, demographic and the low self-esteem that they have collectively and on the individual level. Native Americans, she quotes in the articles, have the highest unemployment, high school dropout rate, alcoholism, drug abuse, teen pregnancy, infant mortality, and suicide. Um, so I go from that piece of understanding, getting a, an idea that I've just made Indians invisible or Native Americans invisible in my life in order not to think about it. You know, um, the piece about waking up white asks, what does it mean to be white? And she has the same story that I have. You know, we both consider ourselves relatively colorblind people with the best of intentions, um, typical NPR liberal. And from there, she states that her inactivity and complacency about social justice issues actually does a disservice. Um, and I, I would have to confer to agree with that now. So in reflection with what I've read for this module, I would say, what does it mean to be white? Being white is the perpetual excluding and marginalizing of target groups to manage the historical guilt of slavery and genocide. Um, which brings us to the three pillars of white supremacy. I'm doing it in reverse order. The first one is ori Orientalism and War, which Smith, paraphrasing Edward Said, explained this as the process of the West defining itself as superior civilization by constructing itself in op opposition to an exotic but inferior Orient. The logic marks certain people or nations as inferior and posing a constant threat. Things that we can relate with that is a uh, anti-immigration, the war on terror, pretty much anything where we mark um, anyone who looks different as an other. From there, we can see how it naturally goes into genocide and colonialism. Smith says that genocide is the anchor of colonialism. Um, we kill them all. We take their land and their resources. And since no one's left, you know, we can we can occupy it. Uh, since they're gone now, no injustice has been committed. So we can sort of see how that in oriental or orient man orientalism kind of works together. The third pillar is Starbucks.
No, wait. Slavery and capitalism. Y'all, as Dr. Oxendine would say, you cannot have capitalism without some form of slavery. Not now, not then, not ever. Capitalism, by definition, commodifies human beings. It requires an inexhaustible pull of free and cheap labor. And as long as we have and support this system, social injustice will never, ever go away. We're simply just making ourselves feel better by talking about it. It'll change marginally in varying degrees, but it will never go away. So as we, you know, upgrade our cell phones or renew our automobile lease, it's important that we all ask ourselves, despite our race, our sex, our color, um, exactly how far are you willing to go for social justice? These are the references, the three at the beginning, and I look forward to viewing all of your initial responses.